welcome today as we gather in worship here in God's house. We're blessed to gather in the name of Jesus. And so we begin in that name, in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our first reading is responsive. It's from Psalm 23, a Psalm of David. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in right paths for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I fear no evil. For you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in right paths for his name's sake. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord my whole life long. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in right paths for his name's sake. Amen. this time we continue by professing our faith through the words of the Apostles Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell, third day he rose again from the dead and ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, 
the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Will you join me as we confess our sins before the Lord our God? Faithful God, have mercy on us. We confess that we are captive to sin and cannot free ourselves. We turn from your loving embrace and go our own ways. We pass judgment on one another before examining ourselves. We place our own needs before those of our neighbors. We keep your gift of salvation to ourselves. Make us humble, cast away our transgressions, and turn us again to life in you. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. God hears the cries of all who call out in need. And through his death and resurrection, Christ has made us his own. Hear the truth that God proclaims. Your sins are forgiven in the name of Jesus Christ. Led by the Holy Spirit, live in freedom and newness to do God's work in the world. Amen. Let us pray. Lord of the feast, you have prepared a table before all people and poured out your life with abundance. Call us again to your banquet. Strengthen us by what is honorable, just, and pure, and transform us into a people of righteousness and peace. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Our gospel reading this morning comes from the Gospel of Matthew, beginning in chapter 22. Once more Jesus spoke to them in parables, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding banquet for his son. He sent his slaves to call those who had been invited to the wedding banquet, but they would not come. Again, he sent other slaves, saying, Tell those who have been invited, Look, I have prepared my dinner, my oxen and my fat calves have been slaughtered and everything is ready. Come to the wedding banquet. But they made light of it and went away, one to his farm, another to his business, while the rest seized his slaves, mistreated them, and killed them. The king was enraged. He sent troops, destroyed those murderers, and burned their city. Then he said to his slaves, the wedding is ready, but those invited were not worthy. Go therefore into the main streets and invite everyone you find to the wedding banquet. Those slaves went out into the streets and gathered all whom they found, both good and bad, so the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came to see the guests, he noticed a man there who was not wearing a wedding robe. And he said to him, Friend, how did you get in here without a wedding robe? And he was speechless. Then the king said to the attendants, Bind him hand and foot and throw him into the outer darkness, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ.
Today we complete our seven-week look at Paul's letter to the Colossians. And we do so by turning, well, to the very end of the book, chapter 4, and we're looking at verses 7 through 18. Here's what this passage uh, has to say to us. Tychicus will tell you all the news about me. He is a beloved brother, a faithful minister, and a fellow servant in the Lord. I have sent him to you for this very purpose, so that you may know how we are and that he may encourage your hearts. He is coming with Onesimus, the faithful and beloved brother who is one of you. They will tell you about everything here. Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner, greets you, as does Mark, the cousin of Barnabas concerning whom you have received instructions. If he comes to you, welcome him. And Jesus, who is called Justice, greets you. These are the only ones of the circumcision among my co-workers for the kingdom of God, and they have been a comfort to me. Epaphras, who is one of you, a servant of Christ Jesus, greets you. He is always wrestling in his prayers on your behalf, so that you may stand mature and fully assured in everything that God wills. For I testify for him that he has worked hard for you and for those in Laodicea and, and in Hierapolis. Luke, the beloved physician, and Demas greet you. Give my greetings to the brothers and sisters in Laodicea and to Nympha and the church in her house. And when this letter has been read among you, have it read also in the church of the Laodiceans, and see that you read also the letter from Laodicea, and say to Archippus, see that you complete the task that you have received in the Lord. I, Paul, write this greeting with my own hand. Remember my chains. Grace be with you. It's our reading for today. Let's begin with a prayer. Merciful and gracious God, today as we complete this look at Colossians, I pray that you would help us to see the reminders that are here. Reminders of faith. Reminders of your great love. Use me, Lord, to proclaim this your message and your word to your glory and in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to not go out on too much of a limb and guess that most of you have seen and or used a post-it note at some time or another. I also suspect that some of you have maybe more than a few of them hanging around your home right now. I don't know if you realize it or not, but they sell about a billion dollars worth of post-it notes each year. I'm convinced that the reason for this is because these sticky notes are the only way we can remember things and they serve as a reminder system for many of us. I opened the calendar app on my computer last week and I began to enter an appointment when it struck me that I desperately rely on reminders from this calendar each day. And it's not just my calendar that I rely on. I also have a to-do list that reminds me of the task I have to get through during the typical week. And then I thought about the fact that I have this app that reminds me of the articles that I've bookmarked and saved to read later. Make no mistake about it, we need reminders. 
As the letter to the Colossians comes to an end, Paul shares some important reminders with us. Today we're going to look at Paul's reminders and what they mean for us as followers of Jesus Christ. Paul's first reminder here is to remember your call. He reminds us to remember our call. I was expecting a phone call last week, and so I wasn't surprised when my phone rang. I looked at the number on the caller ID, and it seemed familiar, and so I decided to answer. Well, I can tell you that this was a mistake. I knew immediately it was a sales call as soon as I picked up. My normal response when this happens is to do that, to simply hang up, which I did. But once I hung up, I started to wonder if there's a better way to respond when next I receive a similar call. And so I did a little bit of research and I came across a list of the best responses to give to sales calls, to telemarketers, if you will. And here are some of the highlights from that list. Here's the first way, if you get this call, here's how you can respond. You can say this, I've been thinking about breaking into phone sales myself. Can you tell me how you got started? That would be a good response. Or how about this one? Hey, great timing, you could say. Can you settle an argument between me and my spouse? Or what about this one? My puppy has been doing the cutest things all morning. If you give me your cell number, I'll text you some pictures. Here's another one, which I like. You could say, I'm happy to speak with you. My billing rate is $500 per hour. If you give me your credit card number, I'll book a time slot just for you. And here's another great one. You could say, I'm busy now, but I'm free around midnight. Can I have your home phone number so I can call you back? Remember these responses for next time you receive a sales call. And yes, there will be a next time. I was thinking about that in relation to our text because the reality is we receive the most amazing call from Jesus. It's the call to experience the gift of forgiveness, and the gift of new life, and the gift of a new purpose. One of Paul's co-workers, he names a number of them here, is an individual named Epaphras. And he knew this call well. Epaphras was actually from Colossae, and he had met Paul when both were in the city of Ephesus. Paul had shared the message of Jesus with Epaphras, who in turn went and shared it in his home community. So I want you to listen to what Paul has to say about Epaphras in verses 12 and 13. He says this, Epaphras, who is one of you, a servant of Christ Jesus, greets you. He is always wrestling in his prayers on your behalf so that you may stand firm and mature and fully assured in everything that God wills. For I testify for him that he has worked hard for you and for those in Laodicea and in Hierapolis. Epaphras remembered the call of Jesus by becoming a servant of Jesus. For him, being a servant of Jesus meant sharing the good news of the cross wherever and whenever possible. He was simply responding in joy to the call he'd received from Jesus. Well, this is a reminder for us that we have the same call. We have the same reason to respond with joy. Our response may look well, different from that of Epaphras, but the key is to remember that we too are uniquely called by God. Now, Paul goes on here and he mentions a more difficult call in verse 17. He says this, Say to Archippus, see that you complete the task that you have received in the Lord. So we don't know the task that was given to Archippus. We don't know what he'd been called to do. But we do know it was from the Lord. 
And we also know that it must have been something difficult because Paul is offering him encouragement to complete whatever he's called to. And so whatever this call, it's a reminder to us that God's call isn't always easy. One of the things I've come to realize about serving God is that it presents us with the highest highs, but also some of the biggest challenges. And it's when we're facing these challenges that we need encouragement from, well, other followers to remember the call we've received from Jesus. So Paul's first reminder here is to remember your call. And Paul's second reminder is to remember God's grace. Verse 18 gives us a bit of insight as to what was going on with Paul at the time this letter was written. Paul says this, I, Paul, write the greeting with my own hand. Remember my chains. Grace be with you. I don't know if you are into electronics or if you have very many, but if you have, then I want you to notice that many of the electronic devices today include a built-in virtual assistant, something you can talk to, to issue voice commands. These virtual assistants promise to make life easier by well, listening to what we have to say and responding and doing just what we ask. Now, I have a problem with these. My problem is that I always feel a bit awkward talking to my cell phone or talking to my computer or to my smart speaker. So I haven't really ever used them. That is until recently. I felt convicted after reading an article about making the best use of these virtual assistants. The article pointed out how every task throughout the day is made well, simpler and quicker by simply using our voice. So I decided I'd commit to this. I decided I'd give it a try and have been dictating voice messages and, and memos most every day since. But one issue I've been having since starting this experiment is that my virtual assistant only seems to listen to about half of what I say. And the half it does here, it seems to manage to somehow get all wrong. Of course, the other issue I have is that there's nothing that can quite replace writing or typing something with your own hands. We often picture Paul alone and seated at a table or a desk with a writing instrument in hand, deep in thought as he poured over some text. And artists throughout history have helped us to picture Paul in this way. But Colossians presents us with a different image. It seems clear here that Paul dictated the letter to a co-worker in ministry. But it's also clear that he signed it and signed off at the end, which is why he says at the end, I write this greeting with my own hand. He was literally writing the very last few words in his own handwriting. And I can't help but think about and imagine the impact this would have had on the Colossians as they read Paul's final words. As he concluded his letter, Paul tells them to remember his chains. This is a reference to the fact that he was in prison. And he says this because he was proud to be in, in prison. He was proud to be in chains. He knew that his imprisonment announced to the world that he was being persecuted because he was a servant of Jesus. The final words that Paul writes and ends with are simple words. He says, grace be with you. And these seemingly simple words and the simple ending is in reality the deepest and richest prayer that we can pray. Paul wants us to remember that grace, which is God's unmerited and undeserved love, is with us 
and it surrounds us and it sustains us. God enables us to be people of thanksgiving. May the Lord bless and keep you in the grace of God through the cross. Let's pray. Almighty, merciful, and gracious God, again, we thank you so much for the opportunity to look at the book of Colossians and to get these reminders from Paul about remembering our calling, about remembering who we are called to be, and about remembering, most importantly, God's grace, which calls us in the first place. Lord, bless and keep us in this now and forever. In Jesus' name, amen. confidence in God's grace and mercy, let us pray for the church, the world, and all those in need. Gracious host, fill your church with a spirit of joyous hospitality. We pray for our local pastors, teachers, church leaders, and all children of God as they invite others to your table of boundless grace. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Gracious host, as creation waits with eager longing for redemption, protect your creations that are mistreated. Restore valleys, mountains, and pastures, and still running waters. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Gracious host, as you set a table in the presence of enemies, so bless the efforts of diplomats, international peace workers, and world leaders who navigate conflict. May they proceed with dialogue and understanding so that justice and peace prevails. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Gracious host, let your greatness be known among those who are weary or ill especially Pastor John Zender as he continues to recover from COVID. And for Shauna, as she prepares for the delivery of twin girls. Lord, for Al Spicer as he enters into hospice care. And Lord, for his wife, Pat, who is recovering from knee surgery. Lord, for Brenda, who is preparing for heart valve replacement surgery. And Lord, for Jan Mahal's son and daughter-in-law, who are in the second trimester of a difficult pregnancy. Lord, we continue to lift up Sherry Mink and her husband, Bill, as they recover. We pray for strength and healing. And Lord, for all of our leaders, all of our senators, state representatives, teachers, law enforcement officers, 
and including our national leaders like President Trump and his wife for quick healing for coronavirus. Strength in doctors, medical care workers, and caregivers who see to their need. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Gracious host, when we are quick to judge outward appearance, remind us how you clothe all in your mercy. We pray for ministries that provide needed clothing and other personal care assistance in this community, especially this morning we lift up Love, Inc. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Gracious host, as we invite those to the wedding feast and invite more into worship with us, continue to protect us and guide our, our church leaders to make ongoing wise decisions for our preschool leaders to continue to make wise decisions and continue to use us to make your name known in our community. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Gracious host, as we remember those who have died and are gathered at the heavenly banquet, comfort us with your presence. Assure us of your peace at all times. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Listen as we call on you, O God, and enfold in your loving arms all for whom we pray. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. May God bestow on us his grace with blessings rich provide. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. 
The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen.